Hello and welcome to Zoology Live 2023. This year we are exploring the amazing world of urban wildlife. So that's the animals and plants that live alongside us in our towns and cities. We'll be doing that both with the live stream tonight, but also we've got a family event on in Cambridge in the museum on Saturday. So do pop in. We've got a link that we're going to pop in the comments so you can find out all about what we're going to be doing on Saturday. But back to tonight, we're going to be getting really close to home by having a look at some of the wildlife that's supported by the David Attenborough building itself. So the David Attenborough building is this big concrete building in the centre of Cambridge that houses the museum. Then later on this evening, we'll be taking a trip across the world to have a look at the urban wildlife found in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. We'll look at how we can support urban wildlife and see how it's inspired members of our Young Zoologists and Zoology Club um, with some of the work that they've created. And we have a special guest who'll be joining us in about 15 minutes time. Ian Webb, who's from the Wildlife Trust, will be here to answer your questions about water bowls and otters, some of the amazing animals that we now get around our city here in Cambridge. So do get your questions ready for him in the comments on YouTube. But we're going to start tonight right on our doorstep here at the museum and look at some of the wildlife here in the David Attenborough building itself. So we shared this building with the Cambridge Conservation Initiative and they've been fantastic at helping us set up cameras on the green roof and they've also shared some of the results of their monitoring of the wildlife that the building supports with us as well. So here is just some of the wildlife that is seen around the David Attenborough building. Particular thanks to Sophie Bretonet, Rona Watson and Duncan McKay there for sharing their moth findings and helping with the green roof footage. So one group of animals we've been really excited to see around the David Attenborough building are swifts, which are actually nesting in the towers. So earlier this week, I caught up with Lorinda Luffman, who amongst other things is the swift species lead at the RSPB to find out more. I'm joined now by um, Lorinda Luffman. Lorinda, so what, what is it particularly about swifts that really interests you? Well, I'm not very good at getting up early in the morning, uh, but I do love my birds. So I do tend to like the birds that are around in the evening. And obviously swifts fall into that category. They they come alive, particularly at about sort of eight, eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock, and really giving us the most amazing displays So can you tell us a little bit about them and their lifestyles? Because they've got quite an extraordinary life cycle, haven't they? They have, yes. They are a bird that, that lives in the air. When they fledge from their nest, they will then go and fly to South Africa or certainly down into the way parts of the African continent uh, and spend all of their time in the air feeding, sleeping and then they'll come all the way back to this country or other parts of Europe to, to breed but the young swifts um, possibly don't even land to breed until perhaps they're two two and a half years old they're the most aerial of all birds in terms of their lifestyle 
So one thing I found really exciting is the fact that we have swifts, don't we, nesting in the David Attenborough building, so above the museum here. What is it about kind of our urban spaces and places like this that, that seems to be good for swifts? Well, so originally they probably would have found nooks and crannies in, in trees, uh, but obviously there aren't enough of those nooks and crannies. So at some point in their evolution, they worked out that they could find the little nooks uh, that they needed in buildings. And of course, a lot of our buildings are in cities. And so that's where they choose to, to nest. And they, But the problem, of course, is that we are renovating our homes and, and any little holes tend to get blocked up. And then they are effectively homeless right, because and Swiss are nest site faithful. So they will fly all the way back from Africa and try and get in the same little hole that they that they nested in the previous year. And if it's blocked up, they will keep trying. Uh, and it's, 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 it's really very distressing. So we do try to um, encourage people to either put in internal nest bricks or put up boxes to make sure that the Swiss have somewhere to return to. But what kind of things have we got on the David Attenborough building to help sort of support the Swifts? Because it doesn't seem like the immediate place that you've got those nooks and crannies in it. No, so we have created special boxes for them on the David Attenborough building, but the building is perfect because it's got a tall tower and Swifts do quite like that bit of height so that they can swoop in into their nest. You know, to have our first breeding pairs there, I think we did attract them with some swift calls, which you can do if you've got a nest site. So when they hear other swifts, they know, oh, here's somewhere I could potentially nest. So it's sort of a top tip of what we can do to help to make sure that you've got places on your houses where swifts might be able to come and nest. Absolutely. It's it's such a simple and easy thing to do and, um, and such an enjoyable thing to do, you know, to have swifts zooming around our houses and part of our lives in the summer. So, you know, it's it's not just helping them. I think it's it's great for us to have these birds around us. So if you want to catch up with the Swifts, check out the live cams from some of their nest boxes that you can see on the Cambridge Conservation Initiative website. We'll pop a link to that in the comments. And if you have seen Swifts around that are sort of around the height of your rooftops, do record them on the RSPB Swift Mapper so that they can better understand these absolutely amazing birds. So our wildlife is not just of scientific interest. It is beautiful, it is inspiring for the arts as well. And with our Young Zoologists Club, which is a free club for six to 12 year olds, and our Zoology Club for 13 to 18 year olds, we mixed science and creativity to make a film together celebrating the wildlife of the River Cam.
So if you are inspired by that and want to find out more about our free clubs for children and young people, check out our website. We'll pop a link in the comments and all the information on how to join can be found there. So we have just a couple more minutes before we're joined by our expert for the evening, Ian Webb from the Wildlife Trust, who is here to answer your questions about water voles and the wildlife of our riverbanks. But first, to get you thinking about all things British mammals, here are a few of the mammals that we can find in our cities. So I'm joined now by Ian Webb of the Wildlife Trust, and he's all ready to answer your questions, so do pop them in the comments. Hello, Ian. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in to talk to us about some of our amazing British wildlife today. It's a pleasure. Um, so we're here to talk a bit about British mammals, starting with one that's been seen a little bit more often lately in Cambridge, which is uh, water voles, one of my favourites. Yeah, good. Can you describe water voles a little bit for us? Well, they are a uh, medium-sized small mammal, uh, about the size of a medium, medium-sized guinea pig, I think is a good way to describe mm -hmm. it. Um, and they are sort of darkish brown in colour, They've got quite a snubby nose. You can't really see their ears very well. Um, so like a large bank bowl or, or field bowl, really. So quite um, not amazingly exciting looking, but very special in their own right. Yeah. So we call them water bowls. Does that mean that you're most likely to see them by the water? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. They, they really rely on having their aquatic habitat either to find food or to help escape predators, etc. So okay. Yeah. What, what kind of things do they eat as well? What sort of Well, they'll eat they any eat? plant. There was a survey done in the, in the mid-90s throughout Britain, a national survey. And the person who was doing the survey counted 227 different species of plant. Wow, I don't they... think I could name 227 well, no, exactly, exactly. different species of plant. But, yeah. So it is very much a generalist on anything, oh, okay. any, any plant material. But also it'll eat um, bark and seeds and nuts and all these sort of things as well. And sometimes there's been evidence of eating carrion, so dead fish or something like that. Oh, okay. So, so they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll try anything, essentially. <laughs> okay. So why are they important? What kind of roles do they do in our habitat? Well, being a, a rodent, a small mammal, they um, breed. They breed a lot, so there's lots of young. Okay. So they sort of uh, they, they feed on, on vegetation. So they're that next layer in the food pyramid or food chain. So they are food for lots of predators as well, like kestrels, herons, otters, stoats, foxes, all the like owls as well. So all these things, you know, if they weren't water voles, there'd be a lot of pressure on the predators to find other food or not find food at all. So their numbers mm. will will not be doing so well. So having a healthy water vole population means you have a lot of other species that rely on small mammals to feed on doing really quite well. Oh, so yeah, we need to look after everything, don't we? Definitely, in definitely. Yeah. So, how can we tell if we've got water voles living nearby? Because I'm guessing, like a lot of mammals, you're not very likely to see the actual animal itself. No. Whenever you're looking for mammals, it's always looking for their poo. It's, it seems <laughs> to be the thing to look for. If you are fortunate enough to see, uh, you know, a live water vole, well, I have some footage from a colleague yeah. um, in Cambridge. Um, one of the things to look for is. Um, they like to use certain spots along watercourses or, or pond edges to, to, to leave their poos. It's a territorial marker. Ah, okay. So you a pile of little, sort of, uh, like a bit large tic tacs, sort of rounded ended brown things yeah. in a little pile. Um, that is one way of showing that there's breeding females in the area. 
as well. So, right. so looking for their poo is a good way. Um, when they were really common, you know, you know um, uh, one of the common things, you would walk along the water, river bank and you'd hear a plopping sound. They plop into the water <laughs> to escape from, from you as a, yeah. as a potential predator. And that um, has been said to be a, quite a good sign as well. But another sign, if you know, the chance of seeing a water bowl, unless you're fortunate, is looking for feeding signs. Yeah. They're being feeding on, on grasses and plant material, um, very much like us. So they have their favourite place to eat. So they oh. have their bite their bit of vegetation off and go into their favourite spot, nibble on it for a bit, but you know, they don't finish their meal and they leave sections of vegetation there. Yeah. Um, and it's quite an obvious if you know, right by the water's edge, a pile of cut vegetation up to ten centimetres long. And because of the sort of nature of they feed, it's uh, there's a it's, the cut end is about forty five degrees. And so oh. it's quite an obvious sign. That's all the. It's not as good a sign as saying a real water bowl or a, or a latrine, but you know the feeding yeah. signs are another good sign. Okay. Um, so, so the fact that they're a little bit messy, they don't finish their dinner, they leave it, poo all over the place. It means that we can find. Yeah, thankfully, they, thankfully, thankfully we can find them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a few things to have a look out for then next time we're, we're sort of along the cam or somewhere like that. And given that we're now getting them even in the city. I mean, I've heard people say they've seen them sort of along Jesus Green mm. and places like that. Yeah. Does that mean that their numbers are um, increasing? Because I know that they have been in decline. Does that mean that their well, yeah, numbers well, are increasing? Well, certainly locally, um, because obviously it's one of the fastest declining mammals. It was quite 90, 90 plus percent decline in numbers and distribution. Oh, gosh. But locally, certainly in, in South Cambridgeshire, um, numbers have bucked that trend. Um, primarily, well, one of the reasons is habitat um, Re-establishment along the watercourses, making sure that they're able to utilise the vegetated banks. Um, but also one of the one of the other reasons, as well as the habitat creation, is the removal of the uh, exotic predator, the American mink, which um, hasn't really helped water voles much. You know, fairly recently, water voles have been declining for since the 1920s and 1930s because of habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. Um, and so they're already declining. But when minks started to escape or were released from fur farms in the 50s, you know, they are the perfect predator for eating water voles, unfortunately. Mm. And the water vole hadn't evolved with American mink. Yeah. So they had no defence. You know, they've got lots of different defences for whether it's terrestrial predators. If there's something on land, they'll just jump into the water. If there's aquatic predators, they'll go into the burrows on the bank. So there's means and ways of getting away from the natural predators. But American mink can swim and they can go inside the waterfall holes as well. So they really haven't got much chance with American mm -hmm. mink being around, unfortunately. Yeah, so we've sort of been getting rid of the mink and... Yeah, humanely so. controlling them on a sort yeah. of a watershed scale, making sure um, it's done in a way that, you know, there aren't mink coming in from nearby, because otherwise you're just you know, dispatching mink without, the, yeah. without any proper conservation result from that. So yeah. it is helping a lot helping with a lot. the waterfalls returning. Yeah. Oh, it's exciting. I can say it's one of my favourite. They're so cute. I know you shouldn't just like them no, so no, no. cute, but they are very cute. Can't say that. <laughs> uh, we've had a couple of questions from the audience. So Penny asks, where are good places to spot water voles in Cambridge? In Cambridge, um, Snaky Path, um, Cherry Hinton, is the place local to me, which is quite okay. good. So if you walk from the bottom end of Mill Road towards Cherry Hinton Hall, that's very good. Seems like Logan's Meadow is a good spot to see yeah. them as well. Your <laughs> colleagues saw some there. Yeah. Um, I went. Um, punting along the river today with my volunteer team, clearing Himalayan balsam, and there are lots of signs along the river. So if you oh. go from from mil the mill pond up towards Grantchester, there's lots of signs there. Um, so anywhere now where there is um, you know, flowing water and good bankside vegetation, yeah. um, because the population is rebounding so well, they will be more commonly found there. Oh, well, Jesus, Jesus Ditch is not on Jesus Common. Yeah. It's sort of Jesus Green. They're they're present there. So you know that. Compared to when I started working with the trust I was serving for water voles, they were not really seen in Cambridge at all. Now they are anywhere there's good habitat. There seems yeah. to be water voles, which is fantastic. Okay. Even recorded in people's ponds. Really? Yes. No, <laughs> no, up to a kilometre from, from watercourses, they'll travel. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. That would be an exciting thing to get, you know, to spot in your garden, wouldn't it? Oh, water yeah. Bowl. Definitely, yeah. Definitely. So in terms of banks, you need, because I'm guessing things like the concrete stone banks that we have through the middle of the city, not going to be good for water bowls. Not really good, unless they can start burrowing into brickwork, okay. which isn't going to happen. <laughs> okay. So, But but along near Stourbridge Common, um, uh, sort of soft erosion protection things have been put in place, like um, coir rolls implanted with... Um, Aquatic, habit, uh, aquatic plants has helped the water hole spread because they're able to 
utilise that habitat and then burrow into the bank rather than having a big piece of concrete or sheet metal stopping them. So yeah. they are spreading when the, when the habitat is created. Okay. So try and persuade people to do that on the banks rather yeah. than making it really difficult. Yeah, impossible. Well, you know, the idea of trying to preserve the bank is, is you know, essential, but there's other ways of doing it. There's more, yeah. less um, uh, intrusive ways to, to deal with yeah. that. So I've got a couple more questions. Okay. So Tracy asks, what do water bowls eat? So we've talked a little bit about that, but do they have a favourite food? Um, I think grasses seem to be quite an important part of their yeah. diet. Um, whenever I've seen, you know, gone up monitoring or serving them, you always find it is predominantly grasses they, they, that they leave in their feeding piles. Um, yeah. yeah, so reeds, sweet grass, just the, the, the bankside grasses as well. So that's yeah. always a good sign. Yeah. And um, is a bold spot more likely at a particular time of day? Um, is it like a lot of things where you have to go either really early in the morning or really um, late? No, I think, I, I remember like when I, because water bowls have been so common for so long, they weren't really sort of researched much to work out their ecology. Okay. And when I started looking at them in, in the mid-90s, there was that sense that they were a bit sort of crepuscular, sort of towards the end of the day, but that isn't really the case. I think it's, it's more of an understanding of, you know, you can, I suppose, a, a little bit of luck Mm -hmm. um, but also just going to the same place regularly. If you go for a walk along Cherryington Brook, for example, you will no doubt see one you know, within a couple of days, probably, if you keep your eyes peeled. Okay. And I should say, it is a bit easier to spot them before the vegetation sort of the, the grows up too high. Yeah. So sort of April, May time is a good time to look into signs. You can, you know, the plants aren't obscuring the water's edge, so yeah. it's a bit easier to see them. Yeah. Okay, so Stephen asks, how old can water bowls live until? Not very long, yeah. unfortunately, as you will imagine. Sort of the average age is up to a year and a half. Some individuals may get into two or three, but with being yeah. a small mammal, um, they sort of live fast, die young, really. But producing lots of young, so there's always going to be uh, water holes to replace them once they get properly eaten by something. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, it's, the, it's the job of a small mammal, isn't unfortunately, it? Yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Penny asks, do water bowls have a summer and winter coat? Um, not noticeably different. I'm mm -hmm. sure they, they shed their, they molt their fur as, as we all do. Um, mm -hmm. But there's nothing, not like a, a stoat and ermine yeah. and stuff like that, yeah. or you know, uh, mountain hares as well. Yeah. That's another one. Yeah. So. I mean, is it is their fur special at all? Because they're spending so much time in the water. Well, they're not very they're not very well um, adapted to living in the water. They have <laughs> um, they have sort of fair, very dense fur to keep the water out. But if they spend too much time in water, they do get waterlogged. And okay. They can you know, get chilled and things like that so they do regularly get out of the water so you, know, you never see one swimming for very long it's only yeah. for you know 30 seconds most sort of swimming along but they'll yeah. always pop out and try and dry themselves off so it's so. not like the sort of sea otters where no, they're no, that no, really no. thick no, specialist no, no, no. fur no. yeah so zoe asks um when water bowls poo to mark their territories do they have more than one just one or does it vary <laughs> <laughs> i have to admit i don't know <laughs> don't know don't know i, I um, I'm sure if you had found a good latrine, you could watch and wait and count <laughs> yeah. them once they go. Yeah. But they do actually use, um, as I said before, their territorial markers. So they will actually rub with their back legs and rub their flanks because they've got scent glands ah. there and squish down on their, their droppings to leave their scent mark. So other water bowls coming along will know that, oh, that's whoever. That's, a, that's not my poo. That's not that's somebody else's, else's poo, yeah. so I'd best leave it alone. Kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, but if they could, if it was it Zoe, Zoe, if she could go and count some, how often they... Yeah. You know, how many they do, that would be fantastic. I'm sure there's okay. <laughs> some research, maybe, I don't know. Okay, there we go. So we'll have to try and find a spot of a river bank with a latrine on and maybe we've got a camera there. That'd be fantastic. Well, we'll maybe just that. stand and watch. Or just stand and watch, yeah. So Aisha asks, you mentioned water bowls are often food for predatory species. What predators would hunt water bowls in Cambridge? In Cambridge, uh, domestic cats would be one. Yeah. Uh, foxes would. Um, There'll be owls, tawny owls are about in the city, um, grey herons would, pike might go for them if they get them, um, otters would as well. Yeah. Um, if there were any mink, there would be mink as well. Um, I know a few places where there's um, weasels about, on yeah. the sort of Coldham's Common area where there are water bowls around there. And they may well go into the burrows and if they find a nest of young, they may well... I was going to say, a whole water, another water no, bowl no, is a bit no, big no. for a weasel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They'll, yeah. they'll go for, young. for the young ones okay. and things like that. So, yeah, yeah they're anything that... Yeah. Like a small mammal will try and eat it. So Yeah. So there's, there's quite a lot, don't you? Yeah. You see yeah, lots yeah. of lots of foxes in Cambridge as yeah. well, I guess. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and Aisha also asks, how many how much offspring does one typical water bowl produce? Well they have two to three broods a year of up to nine 
young. Gosh, that's a lot. So that's young. quite, you know, being yeah. a small mammal, they, yeah. you know, they are there to be eaten by the things, to yeah. pass on the nutrients and the energy from the vegetation they're eating, not just, but you know, to, to pass that through the food chain. So yeah. they are very, very um, uh, fecund, I think the word is. Yes. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah that's, that's a lot of young in a yeah. year. Um, Penny asks, do water voles have webbed feet? That's a good question. No, they don't. Not very webbed at all. So they're not yeah. really, not like otters or water shoes. Yeah. They don't really have webbing at all. Um, so it is well quite pe- peculiar that they are um, uh, called water voles, but they're not really that well adapted for it. So <laughs> yeah. they've just found a, a niche that they've fitted in really well and, and have done a good job of it. Really. Yeah, 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 that's amazing. That yeah, you, you imagine that kind of lifestyle that you'd have loads of adaptations for yeah. it, but they don't. It's probably just relatively recently utilised that that uh, that niche available. And, yeah, um, yeah, gone very well with it. Yeah. So Tracy asks, have you seen a baby water bowl? Never. 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 Are they are they always sort of well hidden in the I've seen, in the burrows? Yeah, um, and you know if if you were dug out a water bowl burrow, you might well see some young ones, but I I've never seen. I've seen small um, water bowls, you know. Those that have recently winged and you know, mm-hmm. dispersing to find new habitat, but nothing really, not tiny little cute ones. Yeah. No. Are they are they kind of, sort of naked and blind when they're born, or are they quite well developed? I think they're quite well developed because well being developed. small mammals, they want to get going quite yeah. quite quick and spread out and do that sort of thing. But no, I have never seen one, but um, um, yeah. Yeah, I would like to see yeah. one. But not yeah. disturbing it but too not much. Disturbing so. it, no, yeah. No. That's the thing, best thing about watching wildlife is to not disturb it. As you it? see far more yeah, if you disturb far. it. Yeah. yeah. Penny asks, how long do water voles stay with their offspring after they're born? It's only about three or four weeks, really, before they're right. weaned and then they go off. Because if they're having three broods like that a year, yeah, you can't spend you can't, that long. No, no, no. Yeah. So it's very much live fast, die young, and yeah. produce as many young as possible. Yeah. So... Well, see if we get any more questions. Cool. I've got just a couple more okay. to... We've got, got some fantastic, really fantastic questions. Thank uh-huh. you for those. Um, and one thing you did mention, and this is one that I'm quite excited about as well, another aquatic animal oh, right, yeah. that we've been getting in Cambridge a little bit, so I hear, uh, otters. Oh, otters, yeah. Really, yeah. really quite common. They're yeah. regularly passing through um, River Cam... Oh, sorry, through Cambridge. And one of the best signs, as you could well imagine, is looking for their... Their, their poo, their droppings, or their springs, because they <laughs> yeah. use those as territorial markers as well. Okay. And when I was doing the punting with the volunteers today, I found one on this, uh, a bit of a tree that collapsed in the river, and you could see the sprint on there and other places. There's anywhere where another otter could find the sprint, they would deposit it. So under bridges is a good place, and they have sometimes their little ledges at the bottom. Yeah. Under bridges, they deposit them there. Wow. Um, trees near to the river bank, where there's easy access for the otter, then come up. So... Um, yeah, anywhere where there's easy access for an otter, they will use that as a sprinting site. So, yeah. yeah, okay, that's exciting. It is very exciting. Them. I mean, I'm guessing that the middle of Cambridge, when we've got all the punts going, that the otters aren't going to come out and say hello. No, not, no. not during the day, but not they will pass the through at night. Through they were night. predominantly seen as, or thought to be nocturnal, but I think yeah. as the hunting pressure's reduced and population's increasing and the habitat's improving, um, they will... I mean, I've seen them in the day. Obviously, I've seen them more towards the evening, towards sort of twilight. But yeah. I've seen them at eleven o'clock in the morning, nearly M eleven on the river there. So, <laughs> gosh, yeah, really unexpected places. But you know, they are found throughout Cambridgeshire now. Yeah. And I think Kent was the last county in England to regain its otters. So every county, every county, every county. Got county. Them. When in think of the nineteen fifties, they were thought they were going to become extinct. Yeah. They were very nearly extinct. They rebounded really, really well. What was it that caused their decline? It was um, agricultural chemicals, persistent chemicals, yeah. DDT, PCBs, that sort of thing. Um, being a top predator, that accumulated in their bodies and eventually sort of caused organ, organ failure and stuff like that, as did a lot of predators in the 50s and 60s. Yeah. Um, and obviously there was you know, um, pollution affecting their, their food, you know, so their fish populations and things like that, and habitat fragmentation and loss as well would have impacted it. But it is that... It was the chemical usage, those persistent chemicals that really did, did them in, yeah. unfortunately. So we're not using those anymore? No, no, no. The, and the, the, the numbers have come back enormously, really impressively. When I yeah. started with the Trust, there were very few records for otter yeah. in the county, and now they are ubiquitous, really. Oh. Um, and it's and that's one of the nice things of knowing, looking for their poo, and you can go to a bridge or a, you know, a tree near a, 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 looking for those signs. And it yeah. smells, if you're willing to sniff it, it smells <laughs> of jasmine tea. Jasmine tea. Jasmine tea. Okay. And when I sniffed some jasmine tea, I thought, oh, yes, it does it's smell like, like otter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So we're getting some top tips here. If you want to find out more about our local mammals, go and look for the poo and learn what yeah, the different yeah. poo smells yeah, like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't sniff mink poo, though. That's oh, really horrible. Okay. I have, I've sniffed badger poo, and that smells... Of badgers, yeah, it's Strangely. quite really <laughs> strong. Of I can't remember, I can't think of another way of describing it. Yeah, yeah. It smells of badgers, badgers. yeah. And um, we've got a few more questions about water bowls. So Zoe asks, how long does it take for a water bowl to become a fully grown adult? Oh, oh, breeding. They will breed within their first. If an early brood will become sexually mature by about four or five months. Mm -hmm. So it may well breed. Well, it might well breed at sort of the end of the breeding season, but. Usually it's into the, the following year that they'll breed, so if sort of sexually mature in an adult sense would okay. be the following spring. The following spring, okay. If they survive the winter. Yeah, is. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Bob asks, do water voles mate more than once in their life? Oh yeah, yeah, they're not, yeah. they're polygamous. The males will mate one, well, the male's territory in, in sort of includes multiple female territories, so okay. he'll mate with the females along his territory and defend that territory, so yeah. he'll mate lots. The females will not mate Several times in a, in a year, obviously, and yeah. they're not monogamous at all. Yeah, okay. Jane asks, what is a water bowl's length of gestation? Oh, goodness me. <laughs> We're getting lots of technical questions right. here. Um, not very long. I was going to say, you've got three weeks to yeah, raise yeah, yeah. them, and you've got so, to mate. So, so how it's about long three or four weeks as well. It's okay. very, you know, very short. They're very efficient. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's they churn them out quite rapidly. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, Aisha asks, do you think there's value in setting up a camera trap in small urban gardens? Um, so, I mean, I'd say that yes. Yes, anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. And uh, you'll see, we've got some videos later that have been captured using camera traps in small urban gardens, and you get some great stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Hearing yeah. about, you know, you wouldn't know it was there otherwise, yeah. because unless it leaves its poo, yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't know it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Poo is really important. I think that's a take home today. <laughs> Tracy asks, can water voles breathe underwater? No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. They, they, they can't hold their breath for very long. If you see, if you're fortunate enough to find a spot where it's one is swimming about, and they don't stay underwater for very long at all. And yeah. they're very buoyant, actually. They look like a, I've heard it described like a cork going in the water, <laughs> or a toy boat. Yeah. It's, it's really quite lovely. So they don't, they don't actively want to swim underwater very much. Yeah. Um, but one of the main reasons is to escape predation. Yeah, um, yeah. And Theo asks, how many species of otters are there? In the world? Because there's, there's only one in this country. Well, yeah, 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 the European yeah. otter. Um, it's probably about 12 to 15, I think. Okay, yeah. Um, they're found throughout North America, South America, Central America, Africa and Asia. Mm -hmm. And they obviously stop before getting to Australia, Australasia. Yeah. But there are several species. There's spot-throated and giant and American yeah. and... Things like that, so about 12, 15 12, maybe. Something like yeah. that. And our European otter, because we get it in the UK, um, how far in sort of mainland Europe? Does it goes it go? all, the way, go across all the way across to Kamchatka, eastern Siberia. Okay. Like sort of Eurasian. Eurasian. Also, yeah. So, I believe, really, yeah. I believe. so quite a wide, yeah, yeah, quite a wide range for that yeah, species. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So, we've been talking about water voles and otters, and it's really great to have. It's really great to have a good news story that their yeah, yeah, numbers they're, they're, are yeah, increasing, definitely, definitely. but that's not the case, is it, for a lot of our wildlife? Um, not, at not at all. Not at all. Is there is there anything particular in our local habitats that you're concerned about? Well, that actually is water. I think yeah. for me, rivers, because that is you know, water is essential for, for most life, um, and the um, the the over abstraction certainly of the chalk streams that mm. is affecting a lot of species. Um, invertebrates, plants, you know, and further on the food chain. So it is, is the quality of the water that is entering the, the chalk streams that is then feeding into the river as well is, is a major concern for me. But also just pond life as well and lake life, you know, the, the very dry springs we've been having recently. Yeah. You know, my pond dried out in the past two summers and that's not helping no. my frog population. Um, so that for me is a concern and, and I think for Cambridgeshire, we are sort of um, so, unfortunately, so um, reduced in numbers of, you know, quality of habitat, etc. Until fairly recently, now a lot of it's been created, and as long as that, you know, we're preserving the existing habitats well and managing it well, then you know certain species are doing well. And it's, it's that sort of the generalist decline, you know, with the, with the drought affecting all the invertebrates. Mm -hmm. um, the general decline in you know migratory birds is an issue. So it is, it is, for me, it's. Water is a major one because obviously water is essential for life. 
Um, but it is just a general decline in the, the number of species and, and, and the numbers of, in populations as well is quite, quite so, sorry to say, but yeah. it is, you have to be honest. Yes, and, yeah. And so you have, it, is, it is bad. But you know, I was out on the river today, Loads of banded demoiselles, lovely yeah. damsel fly. As They're well, amazing at the moment, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, there are hundreds of them. Yeah. Of them. I mean, think because we've got a few projects, haven't we? Locally, things like the Greater Fen project. Greater Fen project, yeah. Is yeah. that is that having an impact already? Well, on definitely. Well, uh, um, yeah. It's you know it is it's allowing. Um, so the Great Fen project is based around the two last few bits of original fen habitat left, and it's buffering them against further. Um, peak degradation or, or a loss of water, but it's also allowing species to expand from those sites into new habitat. So it is mm. the opportunity for species to increase in their numbers. And that's similar actually, um, a lot of the smaller projects like Trumpington Meadows Nature Reserve, mm. I've, I've worked there in the past, and that was formerly agricultural land. And if you yeah. have an opportunity to walk there now, it's full of life. It is I, was, I was there last weekend and it was just fabulous. Yeah, it's a yeah. fantastic place, so yeah. close to Cambridge as well. Yeah. Yeah. Encapsulating you know, aquatic habitats with the, the ponds and the, and the river as well, but that is a showing that if you preserve the existing habitats and manage them well, and yeah. then create new habitats, then the wildlife will respond. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's it is a it's tough wildlife. It will always constantly try yeah. to expand and increase. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Resilient. Resilient. That's the word. Yeah. Thank you. So I've um, got a couple more questions. Okay. <laughs> so I think one going back to our water bowls and otters. Okay. Jude and Sydney ask. Can their colourings vary? Yes, um, the water vole, you can get sort of darker for individuals, so melanistic ones. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen one, um, well, very much like grey squirrels, you get sort of quite dark coloured grey squirrels. Yeah. So you can get melanistic um, um, water voles, and that's often found in Scotland as well, actually. Um, I don't know, I'm sure you must be able to get albino ones, but yeah. not that I've ever, I imagine they get picked off quite quickly because they're quite obvious. Quite obvious. <laughs> yeah. And other, whereas with otters, I don't think there's much, there's they might okay. get some melanistic otters, but I don't, I haven't really heard of that. Okay, um, yeah, oh, interesting. Yeah. And Stephen asks, did numbers of urban species increase much over the COVID lockdowns? I mean, I'm difficult to say, really. I mean, I'm always wondering if things weren't knocked over so much by cars. Do we well, that, see that like, a, less yeah, badgers and foxes less, being killed by cars? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Like um, it's difficult to say, really, because obviously there would have been some change, but then with more people going out and enjoying nature, which is fantastic, yeah. um, that may have impacted those more sensitive species. Um, but with more people valuing nature due to experience of lockdown and doing stuff in their gardens, that is helping wildlife yeah. as well. Maybe on a smaller scale, but if they've done throughout the city yet, to have a major impact on wildlife. Yeah. So that sort of brings me quite nicely to my last question for okay. you, um, which is a question that I like to ask all of our wildlife experts on these live streams. If you could give our audience one tip, one top tip, for something they could do to support their local wildlife, what would it be? Oh, it's, uh, I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> It's join the, the local wildlife trust, Wildlife BCN, the Wildlife Trust. You know, you get this magazine um, three times a year. You support some, well, is it 120 nature reserves we have throughout mm -hmm. the three counties of Bedfordshire, Cambridge, and Northamptonshire. Um, we do fantastic work engaging with um, through education work. We work on a parish based level to help locals engage with the wildlife they have there and help them support creating um, more joined up habitats within their parishes. We work with local, local councils, businesses, you know, and really do impact the wildlife on your doorstep because I always feel um, that yes, tigers and pandas and whales and the rainforest are really important. But if you can, you know, protect the wildlife in your, you know, I haven't seen a hedgehog in my garden for about seven years. Yeah. And, you know, and that is to me impacting me more, not seeing or hearing a cuckoo. I haven't heard a cuckoo this yeah. year. That is impacting me more than on a day-to-day -day level. And you know, the Wildlife Trust is positioned in such a great way to support the local wildlife, whether it be purchasing a nature reserve, and helping manage nature reserves, mm -hmm. getting volunteers out, you know, doing practical, essential conservation work on local wildlife sites is key. Mm -hmm. And the more people supporting it, the more money we can get, the more, you know, the more that we can show local and national government that the Wildlife Trust is being supported by lots of people. Mm -hmm. um, and we can do so much more for wildlife as well if we have more money. So I would say join the Wildlife Trust. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I oh. have to say I'm a member. Well done, <laughs> thank is, you very much. Which is fantastic. And I love going to the nature reserves and getting close to nature and the, the magazines and stuff are great. So, yeah. 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 But, you know, I last night I was out with a group of people at Cherryington Chalk Pits mm -hmm. talking about the wildlife there. And then we went yeah. and finished off looking at glowworms, which you can't, can't that's beat amazing. that. <laughs> have you seen them before? I haven't. Uh, that's one thing. I've not been to see the, the, the uh, glowworms at Cherryington Pits. I, I really want to because I can imagine that's quite a magical experience. They are fantastic. Experience. They are yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been really, really fascinating and great. I feel very privileged to have been able to chat about some of our great local wildlife. So thank you so much. Um, so if you were to walk along the cam, you may be lucky and see uh, some water bowls or even some, well, probably see some water bowl poo and some otter poo perhaps. But you don't even have to go that far to be able to see some really great wildlife. Um, if you take a bit of time to look and listen when you're in your garden or your local green space, you can find some wonderful animals. So here are just a few examples. So we're now going to go from wildlife on our doorstep across to the other side of the world to find out about some urban wildlife in the tropics. And it doesn't get much more urban than the skyscrapers of Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. So last week I caught up with Dr Badrul Azhar of the University Putra Malaysia, who shared with us some of the perhaps more surprising wildlife uh, that they get in the city there. It's worth noting that while Kuala Lumpur is a bustling city, uh, there are still pockets of green spaces and forested area that support diverse wildlife. KLCC Park is a large green park, urban park, that located at the base of the iconic uh, Petronas Twin Towers. Situated near the city centre, uh, the Lake Garden is a sprawling green spaces spanning over 90 hectares. Bukit Nenas Forest Reserve. Uh, it is located right in the heart of Kuala Lumpur. And Bukit Nenas Forest Reserve is one of the oldest uh, permanent forest reserve in Malaysia. It offers nature trails and canopy walks, uh, allowing visitors to experience the tropical rainforest environment. And the last one, uh, Taman Tugu. Uh, this is the latest attraction in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, urban forest park established to preserve and restore uh, the natural biodiversity of Kuala Lumpur. In, in Kuala Lumpur, uh, there are a few notable species that can cause excitement uh, mm -hmm. among nature enthusiasts and bird watchers. Uh, one such example is the oriented uh, pipe hornbill. So these large striking hornbill birds uh, is with a black and white plumage and a unique cast on their bill. And they can be spotted in certain areas of Kuala Lumpur, particularly in uh, pockets of greenery and forested areas. Uh, and apart from birds, uh, there are occasional sighting of other wildlife species in and around Kuala Lumpur. Uh, this can include uh, the macaques, uh, various species of squirrels, monitor lizards, 
snakes uh, and maybe some dangerous snakes, cobra, python, and even nocturnal animal like malayan porcupine in certain areas. Well, a wildlife doesn't have to be rare uh, to be fascinating and bring joy to people. Uh, in Kuala Lumpur, uh, one common species that never fails to bring a smile to people faces is the oriental magpie robin. Uh, these small passerine birds are found throughout uh, the city and are known for their striking black and white plumage like the hornbills. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a melodious song and often seen perched on trees, fences, and even buildings. Uh, and they are quite charming. Uh, they're charming onlookers with their elegant movements and delightful calls. Uh, another common species that can bring a smile to your face is the yellow-vented bulbul, another common bird in, in the city area. Uh, these small, lively birds are abundant in Kuala Lumpur and are easily recognizable uh, by their brown plumage, uh, distinctive, uh, distinctive yellow when on the side, and thick uh, black line between their, uh, their bills and their eyes. While the bird species may be considered common to many bird experts or bird watchers, uh, these everyday encounters with wildlife, urban wildlife can still uh, bring a sense of connection uh, to nature and create moments of happiness uh, to the urban dwellers. These are just a few examples of the green spaces and wildlife experience available in Kuala Lumpur. Thank you for joining us tonight as we journeyed across the world uh, looking at urban wildlife. We hope that you enjoyed it. If you've spotted something exciting, maybe in your garden or on, on your walks, um, why not upload it to our community gallery to share it with our, the rest of our audiences? Uh, we'll pop a link in the comments. It's got all the information on that website on how to do it. Um, if you want to find out more about urban wildlife and you're in Cambridge on Saturday, do pop into the museum to see us. We've got loads of free hands-on activities and we've got talks on swifts and gardening for wildlife. We're running mini beast hunts and wildlife walks. There are even some tours of the David Attenborough building so you can see a little bit behind the scenes of some of the um, biodiversity interventions, so some of the green spaces um, and how we're trying to attract more wildlife on this very concrete -y site. Um, we'll also have showings of wildlife films, uh, hands-on activities and crafts as well. All of it's free. So check out our blog for more details about what's going on. And I'll leave you today with some of the wildlife that we've seen from cities across the world. <laughs>